All right, we'll go ahead and get started with Committee of the Whole. Welcome everyone, welcome to 2021, Happy New Year. Hopefully everybody had a great holiday. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start off with our public notice statement. Um, public notice I, is hereby given that this meeting will occur electronically without an anchor location in accordance with Utah Code 52-4-207 version 4 due to the infectious disease COVID-19 co novel coronavirus. The council chair, myself, has determined that conducting a meeting with an anchor location presents substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at an anchor location because physical distancing measures may be difficult to maintain in the Murray City Council Chambers. The public may view the meeting via live stream at www.murraycitylive.com or via Facebook on the Murray City Utah page. Citizen comments or public hearing comments may be made as follows. Through live, um, through, live through the Zoom meeting process, um, those who wish to speak for the next council meeting, you must have your um, request in by 3 p.m. to city.council at murray.utah.gov. Um, you can also, we can read your public comments into the record by sending an email in advance or during the meeting to city.council at murray.utah.gov. And lastly, comments are limited to less than three minutes, include your name and contact to the Murray City Council Committee of the Whole meeting. Um, we are gonna go ahead and jump into it and approve our meeting minutes. Um, can I get a motion? I will move, if there are no corrections, uh, that we approve, uh, resolve it both at the same time, okay? That's fine. Okay. I'll move that we approve uh, the Committee of the Whole uh, minutes for November 17, 2020, and also December 1st, 2020. I'll second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Um, Brooke? Uh, Ms. Marti or Ms. Mr. Dominguez. Oh, you are the, oh, I'm sorry. I start with someone else. Ms. Turner. Aye. Uh, Mr. House. Aye. Ms. Martinez. Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. And Ms. Dominguez. Thank you. Aye. Thanks. We'll get this down, Brooke. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Um, we are, that has been passed. Thank you so much. And we'll go ahead and move into our first discussion item. Um, Melinda will be presenting the general plan and zone map amendments to 861 East Winchester and 6520, 6550, and 6580 South, 9th East RC Willie. Go ahead, Melinda and Jared Hall, I believe will be presenting. Yeah, thank you. I'm actually going to let Jared take the reins on all three of these tonight. So you'll get the pleasure of hearing this right from Jared. Pleasure is the wrong word probably, but okay, we'll go with that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, am I able to share my screen? Yes, I think I am, so give me one second. And we will share, is that the wrong screen? Are you all seeing the general plan amendment and zone map amendment slide? Yes? Okay. Um, I just wanted to start out by, um, this is, as, as Rosalba said, the, the RC Willie property. That's probably how it's most familiar to everybody. Um, it is 9.11 acres on the west side of 9th East and Winchester Street. The general plan amendment request is from, um, from general commercial to mixed use, and then the zone map amendment from CD, uh, our kind of standard commercial development zone to mixed use. And just to show you kind of where this is, again, this is the RC Willie property. It's most of the frontage of 9th East, uh, and then the large parcels that make up the RC Willie property, the building itself, and the parking lots uh, to the west. Um, as, was, as was mentioned, I, I believe, um, recently and in, in several in several different places. This is the RC Willie property is slated to close and cease to be RC Willie in February uh, of this year. So coming coming right up. Um, at that time the, the building will go will go vacant and the owners um, 
were casting around for different people to redevelop the property. I, I believe they did um, attempt to find some some retailers that could use the box, grocery stores, that kind of thing. There were no there were no viable options, and they um, elected to appeal uh, to us for uh, a change of zoning. Uh, in order to do that, I'm just going to quickly show you. In order to do that, the current zoning is CD, and as we mentioned, they want to change the zoning to mixed use. But to explain that a little bit further, uh, this slide shows the property in the future land use map um, that's part of our general plan, hence the general plan amendment and the zone change, uh, the zone map amendment. Um, the general plan's future land use map looks a lot like a zoning map. It is not. These are general plan future land use map designations. All of this yellow here is uh, low density residential, coincides with the actual development. The pink along the frontage of 9th East and Winchester in these areas is uh, residential business, which corresponds to our residential neighborhood business zone that we have in place in some of those on some of those properties. And the red here in the corner is commercial. Um, planning staff had started to think about and talk about uh, the potentials of some of these larger box properties to, in the future, uh, request changes to mixed use zoning as mixed use zoning is, or mixed use development is kind of the, the way that um, most new development is, is occurring these days. And this was on our, on our radar um, for the future. It was further out than this, honestly. We weren't expecting the change to happen so quickly, but uh, with R.C. Willie leaving, the request came sooner than we thought. So the request is twofold then, just to make sure you understand the future land use map request to change from general commercial as a category to mixed use as a category in order to support a zone change from commercial zoning to mixed use zoning. Um, there are some, some differences obviously with um, area requirements like uh, height, for example, is listed on this slide, 35 feet in the uh, CD zone with, when you're within 100 feet of residential zoning, get an additional, an additional foot of height for every four foot of setback. In the um, in the mixed use zone, it's a 50 foot maximum located within 100 feet, and then one to one as it gets further away. So it's a a, a little more liberal with heights. Um, landscaping and buffer requirements there's a, a significant difference, but the bigger difference is that we have a lot more flexibility in the mixed use zoning to impose conditions and. And and kind of buffer residential uses and things like that through other through other mechanisms that are are more they're more detailed in the mixed use zone. There are requirements for pedestrian paths and more open space and things like that. So I wouldn't say they're lesser; they're just different. And then this, the most significant difference that I want to point out is that is is one of use, not of of sort of area requirements. There are no residential, multifamily, or single family allowed in the CD zone. In the mixed use zone, residential uses are allowed as as uh, multifamily, higher density mixed use, uh, residential, as long as it's accompanied by the appropriate kind of commercial development. That's the most significant difference. Um, the Planning Commission did hold a public hearing for these two items on December 3rd. There were 119 public notices mailed out for the 500 foot distance, every property owner within 500 feet, and then the affected entities uh, as well. Um, there were comments received during the meeting and before the meeting. Most of the concerns um, were about parking coming into the neighborhoods, um, additional traffic on Winchester 900 East that are that are busy streets anyway, crime coming from multifamily housing, lack of, of property values, that kind of thing. And then in, in particular on, on this particular property, we've heard in the past too about stormwater issues on Labor Avenue and the property does back up to Labor Avenue. Um, the Planning Commission did vote seven to zero to recommend approval to the plant to the City Council based on these findings of fact. Um, I just want to go through those really quickly to kind of highlight the reasons that staff and the Planning Commission felt like the change to mixed use zoning, while a significant change, is appropriate. Um, first of all, the general plan allows for this kind of change. That's number one to, to recognize. It's not like these are these kind of changes are just not anticipated or never considered. It does allow for them based on individual circumstances. The other fi the second finding that was made was that this amendment is supported by the description and intent of the general commercial land use designation. And uh, to, to be a little more specific about that, so I'm gonna switch back to that slide real quickly. This general commercial area, each of these different colored areas, they, they promote or support different zones. So when you look at them and say, well, the future land use designation is, for example, in this area, low density residential, that supports 
three or four different zones, R110, R18, R16, all contained within that low density residential category. The general commercial category does not include mixed use zoning as a supported zoning category. However, the reason we make this finding that it anticipates and supports um, the appropriateness of mixed use development is because of statements that were made, not just the designation itself, but the description of the designation includes an anticipation that high density um, multifamily housing is a common component of new retail development and new commercial redevelopment and that the city should look toward that as part of the future. So it is not supported as a category, but it's considered at least. Uh, thirdly, the proposed zone map amendment um, conforms to the goals and objectives of the 2017 Murray City General Plan um, in a lot of different ways, but significantly also that it will support appropriate redevelopment of that subject property. It's a commercial corner. Um, staff's finding and the planning commission's finding was that if we want to salvage some commercial uh, base in that corner, have commercial activity in that corner, the best way to do that is to support a mixed use project. And fourth, that the request amendments have been considered on the characteristics of the site and the surrounding area and on the policies and objectives of that plan, and we do find them in harmony. Um, that's all I have on that subject. I wanted to leave time for the council to ask questions if they had any. Council members, does anybody have a question, comments, concerns? Dan, go ahead. I have a question. I have a question. You indicated that the general plan allows for changes. Um, so what do you mean by that? When, when we did the general plan in 2017, it, it was a two-year process, and, and Brett, you and I were, were in those meetings and then part of that process. Right. So it's it's not just you know a simple simple process and it's done as you said every 10 years. So when you say that it allows for changes, my understanding is that the general plan is uh, developed to make sure, I mean it took a lot of study and a lot of research to make sure that um, we're protecting the, the uh, residential community, uh, community development, that, uh, that, you know, everything is considered, like you said, the water, the parking, the, uh, the density, um, you know, and, and I, I just think we need to be very careful about this, about changing the general plan, because as I said, the process, you know, we took it to the community and uh, I just, I have real concerns on both this one and the next one that we're going to be considering at the sports mall. So my understanding also that this is going to be high density, correct? Um, well, yes. I mean, um, the so let me let me see if I can if I can respond to some of that. And starting with high density residential, it is so right. the density that would be supported by this particular property. It's far enough from. You might remember um, the end of twenty nineteen or mid to late 2019, we looked at the mixed use zone and made some changes to the mixed use zone. One of those changes was to grade the densities that were allowed in mixed use zoning down as you got further and further from transit opportunities. So this property being a long way from transit opportunities like the track station down at Fashion Place West or the, the heavier bus lines like the bus rapid transit that's planned for State Street will only allow up to 40 units per acre. Now that is high density. The highest that you see in, in kind of traditional apartment complexes that were built in the 60s, 70s, 80s is about 20, 25 units the acre. So it is higher density, but it's not nearly the density that we would see in the core of the city or around transit stations. 40 units the acre is what's supported because it's a long ways out. Um, working backward from there, it's I, I would agree with you that the um, that it has to be undertaken carefully. The general plan was a long process and the intent was that uh, that changes to the general plan would be allowed specifically and that's stated at the beginning of the plan. It's not intended to be a static document necessarily but changes need to be undertaken carefully and with lots of consideration. And that's one of the reasons that we stopped short as a city of saying, 
commercial designations will all include limited uh, limited opportunities for higher density housing, although that was a consideration as we first started looking at this in 2017, well, in 2015 with the consultants. Um, but we stopped short of that, but still left that supporting statement in that general commercial category saying, you know, it, it's, understand it, it's understood that higher density housing is going to be a component of many proposals for redevelopment. The city needs to consider that. So it, it, it's appropriate in my view, although it is a big change. But mostly downtown. And True. also the general plan looks at, looks at everything and makes sure that things are balanced. Uh, you know, the density issue, uh, you know, the, like I said, the parking issue, you know, all those things. So it was, it was studied and studied. And uh, so I just want to make sure that we're really looking at everything and considering all the options and uh, making sure that this is the best thing for that, for that area. It's a good point. And, and, for, for our part, we feel like we're doing that with this recommendation. We do really feel as staff that the, that the appropriate use for this corner is, is mixed use, that retains some commercial development, it retains some commercial, but that it, it requires commercial that is more oriented to the neighborhood and the, the passers by in the area as opposed to a destination like a furniture store. Um, so it's, you get a lot of benefits from, from mixed use development that you don't get from standard retail development in that you have reduced trips, you, have, you provide some decentralized, not fully decentralized commercial services, but somewhat so that every time somebody needs a gallon of milk, they don't have to get in a car and drive 15 minutes down to the core of the city to get it. Then you only go to the core of the city for the things that you can't get in other places in sort of smaller village oriented uh, mixed use developments like this would be at 40 units to the acre with commercial out in front. Much like we did at Van Winkle. Yeah. Diane, can I step in right here? Yeah, just uh, let yeah, me ahead. add that it also requires a lot of services. Um, yeah. You know, that kind of is, is, I know it makes money for the developer. Also requires a lot of services. So it costs the city as well. And yeah, I think, you know, that there. needs to be considered as, you know, part of this. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sorry, Greg, you go. No, you're good. I just, thanks, uh, Diana, and thanks, Rosalba. Um, I just echo what Diana said. I've had uh, uh, quite a few contacting me regarding this uh, in my district. And um, just echo on the general plan, what Diane said uh, about, um, it seemed like, Jared, that we were uh, over the last, oh gosh, ever since I've been here, that. Ninth East and Winchester, they were trying to move towards residential business. And uh, that's what, you know, not everything, but that's what the majority of things along Ninth East on the West side and on the uh, uh, Winchester. And so um, density is a huge thing for the residents up there. And, uh, you know, it changes from, what what did we say? 35 to 50 feet. And so, um, yeah. Uh, that, that I'm getting quite a bit of uh, concern in that area, and I, I echo that concern. I echo what Diane has said on that also. Sure. Anyone else? Dale, go ahead. Yeah, if I might. And I, I agree with, with Brett and uh, Diane. Am I correct in assuming there could be up to 360 units there? Uh, at 40 units the acre, 40 units the acre is the base density that's allowed. So that, it's a pretty simple calculation to do based on the acreage. And I, I haven't done, got it right in front of me, but that also gets tempered by their ability to provide the commercial that we would require for that. And then to, to make it work for exiting, there are, there are requirements for how many units you can have before you get certain numbers of exits out onto public roads and things like that. So it does, it's not always achievable necessarily, but the straight number would be whatever that is times 40. I don't have my calculator right here to do it. Yeah. Is that it's about 360, Dale. See, I, I graduated from Jordan in 1968, and I did that in my head. Nice. Uh, I worry about traffic as well. I mean, that's and, and traffic is a thing that we're going to deal with forever. It's not going to go away. Uh, we have the same problem downtown, but we have a little better system down there with with State Street and tracks and buses. Uh, I don't know that there's been a traffic study. I would bet there hasn't, but that's going to be a lot of lot of uh, cars 
pouring out on 9th East and on, on Winchester, both AM and PM, to, uh, for us to mitigate. So, you know, I, I agree with the other two council people. We, we need to take a good, hard look at this and make sure it, it fits what we're trying to do. Pat, do you have anything to add? I was going to ask a question, and sorry if there's some background noise. Hang on, I'm gonna holler at my camera. <laughs> sorry, yelled off camera for a minute. <laughs> my son just got home from grandma's. Um, so uh, my question was just about mixed use in general. And um, my understanding is, and please correct me uh, if I'm wrong, Jared or Melinda, um, but mixed use is a newer, designation, right? Is that when I look at the general plan, I don't see it the way I see other types of zoning. Is that something that's newer being added? We have, um, I'll, I'll take this and let Melinda jump in whenever you, whenever you want. We have three different designations in the general plan that all include mixed uses. Um, the MCCD, the TOD, and mixed use itself. And newer is probably right. It, it's definitely not new. Mixed use has been around as a concept. It's actually kind of a return to, to sometimes they call it traditional neighborhood development. This is, this is going back to the way things were before, before everything was centralized and, and, and automobile transit was kind of the assumed method of getting around. So it's newer. It's been in practice for cities and planning for 25 years. And I'm sorry, I think I think I spoke strangely when I said that, because I'm a big fan of mixed use in general and the walkable neighborhood. And sure. personally, I'd rather live near apartments and stores than I would a giant big box store. Um, but there are the height issues that the others mentioned. But I mean more just when I look at the map, and again, I'm, I'm newer to zoning in general. And so this is a very like basic way of saying it, but the colors look different to me. Um, when I look at the map, the mixed use is purple. And when I look across it, I don't see that. So I guess that's what I'm asking. Are we just slowly shifting what's already there to that as part of the plan? Um, so new, I guess, is in the map yeah. and the designations and what we're doing as a city. We, we probably actually shrunk the the use of mixed use as a in 2017. We had huge swaths of the city that were designated for mixed use. We we pared that back a little bit and tried to be more strategic about it. And then in turn also included that statement in the general commercial category saying, you know, it, where, wherever it becomes appropriate, and that's going to be at nodes that are identified along 9th East and along State Street, um, where it's appropriate, we want to consider that new development reinvestment in the city is going to mean accepting mixed uses. So, yes and yes and no, I guess is kind of the answer. I think. Thank you. And I, I think I'm just remembering a conversation long ago, but not enough of the details to to be helpful. Maybe. Um, but sure. but I appreciate that, and I'm trying to get sort of the history of uh, as uh, Council Member uh, Diane was a uh, part of the last you know, major map where I wasn't. So trying yeah. to get the, the history and see see where we're coming from. Thank you. You bet. Jared, if, if I can add a couple of points. Sure. I want to validate the council members' concerns on the general plan and um, the process that we went through and how uh, in-depth that was. And in general, we have, um, especially coming right on the heels of having a general plan approved. We'd like to support what was approved, what went through that public, public process. And, um, and so in the past, the first couple of years after we approved that plan in 2017, we came forward with several zone map amendments and general plan amendments that were not in harmony with what was in the general plan amendment and actually had negative recommendations for those properties and the, and the applications that had been submitted. Um, part of what Jared mentioned earlier in the findings is that the general plan does have the ability for some flexibility because there's always going to be changing market conditions, changing um, environmental conditions, all sorts of things that would necessitate a general plan to be amended. Uh, that being said, we uh, the first general plan amendment that we supported after the 2017 plan was changed was 
the designation of the property, the old Kmart property, to go from commercial to mixed use. Um, prior to that, that was, uh, uh, we had several applications, again, that, that staff didn't support because we wanted to uphold the process that had gone through with the 2017 plan and that being so close in time to when those applications came through. Um, we're now in 2021. Uh, we did the rezone last year, I guess now two years ago for the Kmart site in 2019. And so while it still may feel very recent, and I, again, don't want to discount the process that we went through, we're now four years out on that general plan uh, amendment being done. And actually in a year, we're gonna start the process for the next general plan amendment because those need to be done every five years. Um, and so it, just to say, I, I, I completely validate those concerns that you have. Um, and I think you're right to have those concerns. We had those concerns as well and mitigated those within the first two or three years of not having any of those um, amendments coming through with a positive recommendation. That being said, as this application came to us, we considered that process we went through previously with the Kmart site and, and really the conclusion that, that we had after talking with the property owners and the lengths that they had gone through to try and find people to come build that, that box store, the changing market conditions that we had prior to the pandemic, those that we have now with the pandemic, we felt like in the long run, we could have this property sit vacant for a couple of years like the Kmart site did, um, or we could move forward with finding, you know, recommendation for the general plan amendment and the zone amendment. And we felt like the findings and information was there to support that, which is why we're bringing this to you. But just a little bit of context on um, the general plan. Uh, uh, oh. Go ahead, Diane and Brett. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Melinda, my con an another concern is that the general plan supports Murray City, Murray's vision, and that's what it's kind of, you know, that's what it's there for. And I just don't think the vision for Murray should be, um, you know, these huge apartment buildings that uh, are requiring so many resources. I don't think our citizens would be happy with that. And I've been told on many occasions that, uh, you know, they don't want our, our city just filled with, with high density apartment buildings. I mean, I hear that all the time. So I think, I think um, the general plan protects that. That's why I'm concerned, you know, that bit by bit we're eroding it. it and we need to be very careful. Thank you, Diane. Brett? Thank, thanks, Rosalba. Yeah, I, I'm just filling in this. Uh, in fact, uh, Melinda, when you said what you said about Kmart, I had that same thought come to me, but I just don't feel that this is the same. It's a different area, and uh, uh, the corner of Winchester and Ninth East, I just don't believe it's the same as Kmart. You know, I, I could be wrong, but I just feel that uh, this area here is just uh, mixed use does not fit there. But that's 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 Brett Hales's opinion. Anybody else? I, just one more thing. I I agree, Brad. I think that um, it made sense in the Kmart area. I'm just not so sure it makes sense okay. in these others. I have a question. Um, or maybe this is for Diane and Brett. How long did you guys do go through the general plan to get it to where it needed to be? And as far as services go, was that included into the general plan as is now? Well, I know Diana was what a two-year process. I guess Melinda, it was. Uh, I mean Jared could answer that, but it seems like it was a two-year process, and I don't know the answer. It was. To the question, yeah. was the last question. Jared, were the services included in that? I, I would say it depends on what you it depends on what you mean by services. Is, so, is the transportation? So example, can, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. For example, what concerns me is, of course, sewer and water. 
especially after the report that we got for the projected growth according to the general plan, right? Um, police services, fire, um, transit, all of those, the schools. If we have 360 units that are one or two um, built, like one to two, whatever, bedrooms, that's possible, we're, we're gonna have more families in those units and that's gonna put some stress onto our school system. So considering the general plan, was that something that was a part of the general plan and the studies or the study for it to be where it's at now to make this change? Are we prepared for that change? Yeah, I, I believe that we are actually, when you, when you look at the services that need to be provided. And, and in part, I, I guess I believe that because you have to be looking at the long, the long term. It, are there upgrades that are necessary because you're building higher density housing and new commercial development, redevelopment? Yes, th there are. Are they, does the return that you get from that investment outweigh the return you get on, in, on not receiving the investment or on a different kind of investment? Yes, it does. Um, if there are, and it's just simple math, if there are 100 units along a 200 foot stretch versus six homes, the, the return on that investment is greater. It's not like you don't spend resources on single family neighborhoods. In fact, you probably spend more resources on single family neighborhoods than you do on, well, you do actually, it's not a, it's not a probably, you, you do. The single family neighborhoods are subsidized by commercial development and multifamily housing. They, 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 they are in some ways, but that's not really the, it's not really the driving issue here. It's not an attempt to make up some deficit or anything. It's, it's about the, our considerations as staff and the planning commission were along the lines of what the appropriate reinvestment in the property would be versus all those kinds of considerations. So um, additional growth always causes strain on services. That's true. As the city grows, you don't have the same number of police or police officers or firemen that you did in 1960 something. It's, it's grown since then. And those, those new officers are needed. Those new services are needed. That's just a, a given. And the city will continue to grow um, in, in one way or another. And you feel the effects of the growth of other cities as well. This is a regional issue. All these things, transit, traffic, uh, population density, these are all regional issues. Those are considered and, and it's appropriate in the regional context. It's on 900 East, which is an arterial. It's on Winchester, which is arterial. These are streets that, that carry a lot of traffic. Um, mixed use developments don't in studies produce the kind of traffic that, that other developments do. They can produce less. It's a long-term deal. We, we've heard a lot of comments from folks saying, you know, we've built mixed use developments and we don't see any benefit from them yet. Well, we built mixed use developments in the last six years. This is, this is a long range change. Um, it's, it's intruding on the property and it's gonna be empty in 60 days. Um, so something's gonna change there. Um, I, I will continue to support mixed use. I think that's the appropriate use there. It's not necessarily gonna produce 360 units. They are taller and that's, I, change is difficult. Um, but mixed use zoning lets us work with that plan as they produce a plan to try to mitigate those impacts and pull some of that development away from the single family neighborhoods that it's going to be abutting or would be abutting and, and try to deal with those issues through design. That's the best way to do that. I, I think um, we're learning. We don't always succeed in doing that as well as we should maybe, but we're trying to do that as best as we can to listen to the neighbors and, and try to protect what they've got. Um, but that's, that's kind of where we are. I, it's not gonna remain a parking lot. In some ways it's, it's gotta change. There wouldn't be connected accesses through to their neighborhood. So traffic's not gonna impact them other than Ninth East would be more busy and Winchester would be more busy. That's true, absolutely true. But Ninth East and Winchester aren't stopped at the edges of Murray. So as development happens in Cottonwood Heights and development happens in Taylorsville and development happens in Mill Creek and Sandy and wherever else, they're gonna get more busy anyway. So that's going to happen as time goes forward. And in the, without sounding glib, in the, in the long view of things, 300 units isn't denting the kind of busy that all of our traffic is going to get if we don't continue to do the right things, which we are doing as a city, which is adding the density where it's most appropriate in the core of the city with transit opportunities. There are some transit opportunities here. 40 units the acre isn't out of bounds for what's available, in my opinion. So my next question is, why wasn't it zoned already in the general plan as mixed use? Um, so 
there was some discussion about adding mixed use as a potential category for any of the general commercial, any of the areas that were zoned general commercial. So we would have just added mixed use as a supported zone. The Planning Commission and Council shied away from doing that and stopped short at just that statement supporting or recognizing the need for high, higher density housing as redevelopment occurs in these areas. Um, at the time, in 2017, um, the, the, the statements were, well, it's probably five to 10 years away. And we were saying it's probably two to three years away. We're right at the three years and the pressure's here. So we, it, without sounding glib again, we should have included it. it. We tried to, it didn't get included. In my opinion, if we could go back and do it, I guess I would push harder and try to get it included. So we didn't have to feel like we were making a more significant change to the plan than we're probably actually suggesting. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Anyone else? Madam Chair, may I uh, may I take Yeah, please, Mayor, go ahead. Uh, I want to uh, kind of circle back to uh, the uh, question that Council Member Hales almost asked, <laughs> but he, uh, and that is the uh, the RMB along Winchester, uh, uh, all the rezone that's been uh, going on there. Now I recognize that. Uh, the corner is is already commercial, but maybe you could explain because I think that's not. I'm not trying to speak for you, uh, Brett, but I think that's uh, what you started to ask is is that why isn't this uh, being considered for R and B? So, so Jared, maybe you can address that. Sure. Um, if there are two kind of things about that, I and the first one that comes to mind it came up during the planning commission's um, discussion of this item, and. Part of the reason that it wasn't included was because it was the RC Willie and, and everybody just probably assumed it would stay the RC Willie forever, which was a fair assumption at the time. The other component is that we tried not to, we tried to just use properties that directly fronted uh, 9th East or Winchester. And it is the hard corner of 9th East and Winchester. So more serious commercial is more appropriate. Commercial, like for example, the RNB doesn't allow drive-throughs. Um, those are or restaurants, things like that. Those are drive-throughs and restaurants. Those are great components of a potential mixed use plan at this corner. It's a good high traffic corner with some residents right behind a restaurant. It would do well um, in combination, but in an R&B, the drive-through component wouldn't be allowed. And part of that was because of the depth of the property. It's not a, just a frontage property. It goes back several hundred feet to where it connects. And when you have that kind of depth, it's hard to do the, the things that we try to do in the RNB zone with scale and um, residential looks and things like that, smaller buildings, et cetera. Uh, with that size of property, if it were zoned office, for example, you wouldn't see a bunch of, you'd have a bunch of small offices in a small office park of some kind, and that generates traffic and, and, and other kinds of issues. RNB was intended to be a very small, very intimate zone, and it didn't really fit at a, a 13 acre corner parcel. So I think that's the twofold reason it wasn't there. First, it was already developed, as you said, Mayor. It's already commercial. It's already RC Willie. And then it's a, it's a larger property. We tried not to rezone or tried not to include large properties in that R&B category. Can you talk a little bit about the conditional uses between mixed use and, and um, what we have already? Sure. Um, a lot of them are the same. If you look at retail uses in the CD zone and in the MU zone, a lot of them um, mirror each other. Um, mixed use, the, the, the really the main component is just that a, a high density or a high rise um, multifamily uses require conditional use in the MU zone and they're just not found in the CD zone. Otherwise, most of them are the same. Uh, the one significant difference is that automobile oriented businesses are not allowed in the mixed use zone where they are in the CD zone. So you can do auto sales and auto repair um, auto detailing, painting, that kind of thing in the CD zone, but not in the mixed use zone. It doesn't allow any auto oriented businesses. But otherwise, the conditional uses are largely the same. So, my last question is um, I know some, I think it, you had mentioned nodes. This mm -hmm. isn't one of the nodes. Or it it the actually, I, I believe it is actually. I'd have to pull that and I didn't, it's not in the slides. Because um, there's a node on close to Vine. Uh -huh. Not this one. Let me see if I can pull up that. Let me see if I can pull up that uh, that map and, and share that if you don't if you okay. don't mind. It'll take a second. Sorry. No, you're fine. Because I know in the notes they talked about the growth and increase with mixed use and maybe transitioning. 
Yeah, you're right. And talking, the nodes are intended to say, look, in, in the area around this node, we need to be more flexible than normal in what we consider for general plan changes and zone changes. Um, and this, this may not be, I'm not sure. I, I know that the sports mall is close to a node at 56 then, at 56 and 90. I'll try to find that on this while you're talking. Okay. Anybody else have any comments, questions, concerns? Sorry, I'm just looking at it right now. So that's why I had asked. Yeah, if you have that report up and it's not one, then great. I can't, I don't have it that. <laughs> Sorry, I would just, can <laughs> you kind of, yeah, go I ahead. I don't think yeah. it is. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's not. I, I, I see it as not being a node, but I know that that was mentioned. Go ahead, Diane. Yeah. Oh, I'm just wondering, Jared, what are we doing about developing nodes? I mean, I always thought that was such a great idea to have, you know, neighborhood areas that have restaurants and things like that. And but I don't see anything being done about that. So that's, a, that's a great wondering. question. I, I think it's probably just bandwidth. We we tried to get things move really slowly. We've been trying to get funding for different studies and things and to do to develop to do. A, you'd want to do a small area plan like we've done with Fashion Place West or like we're in the midst of doing a Fashion Place West around the nodes. Um, we tried a couple of times unsuccessfully to get the Wasatch Front Regional Council to help fund us for a study around one of our nodes. They're more interested in helping us do the studies around the transit stations themselves. So um, we'll, we'll look for alternate funding sources to do small area plans and really, like you mentioned before, you got to get it right. If we do it right, it can be really cool around those nodes. And we want to do that. We just are using the easy money first. I'm probably saying that badly on record, but we're using the easy money from the WFRC first to do our small area plans around the stations. And we're almost done with that. So we'll be looking for alternate funding sources now. But we'd like okay. to, absolutely. Yeah, I just think we can be creative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot more creative ways to use the, the space than, you know, than density housing. So it's my, yes, my opinion. Yes. Thank you, Diane. As of right now, we don't know what the property owners would like to use. We know what they've done in other areas, right? I mean, that's not in our scope. It's just a change. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Any Anyone else have any comments, questions, concerns? Nope. Okay. You know, before, you go, before you go, I do have one. Has it always been 50 feet? That seems high. Uh, backing up to a neighborhood. Yeah, we didn't we didn't change the height when we when we looked at the changes to the MU zone back in 2019. We didn't make changes to the height. Um, at 35 feet, allowed for a single family zone. 50 feet is a 15 foot add on, so that'll let you do. If you were within 100 feet of that property boundary, you could do a you know you could do a fourth story. And well, probably wouldn't get you the fourth story. Get you a third story. Uh, so a townhouse or something like that would probably be the likely candidate for that corner. Usually they kind of birthday cake them with three stories or a townhouse and then go up toward the middle. Because there's a hundred foot. Uh, hundred foot. Yeah. yeah. Anything taller than the 50 has to be at least a hundred feet away. But yeah, well, it's always been 50. How far away does the 50 feet have to be from the houses it's backing up to? Well, 50, 50 feet would be within what we normally would allow, say, 20 feet. We usually see 20 feet set back, at least, for buildings like that. And that's one of the things about mixed-use zoning. We can, we can work on the design and require different things to mitigate the impacts because that's why the, any multifamily housing in that zone requires the conditional use permit. One of the only things that the Planning Commission in approving a conditional use permit gets to do is impose conditions to mitigate impacts. So they can look at a building and say, well, you're, you're allowed 50 feet, but we don't want you 10 feet off of the property line. We get to impose a condition of greater setback to mitigate your impact. So we have the, the ability to do that. Okay, thank you. you bet. How, many, how many stories is 50 feet? Just, just remind. It depends on the stories. In, in, you need at least 10 feet for a story, um, okay. but realistically in, in modern development, you need 13 or so, probably 14. Okay. For the stuff that they're building for the rents that they want, you need 13 feet, yeah. Okay. 
All right. So in the K, I'm just trying to remember what we did for the Kmart property. I think there's was five stories, right? The uh, five, yeah, that's, a, that's a good memory. The, the tallest one is five stories, but it's on the interior. The the shorter building is about 140 oh. feet from the property line, and it's the it's the 50 feet. Okay. Four stories. Okay. Just trying to yeah. visually have a visual. You're right on. All right. Thank you, Jared. Anyone yeah. else? All right, I guess we'll go ahead and move on to discussion item number two, zone map amendment on 192 East, 4500 South. Um, so in fit, Melinda and Jared, go ahead. See if, are you all seeing the so in fit zone map amendment slide? Yes, okay. So the um, this is a zone map amendment from, uh, it doesn't include the general plan amendment like the the other two that are on tonight's agenda do, but it does include just a zone map amendment from general office geo to CD commercial development at 192 East and 4,500 South. Um, let me show you the map there. These, this is a smaller property right along the South side of 4,500 South. Um, it is in the geo zone right now. Uh, and this whole area, you can see there's some CD zoning right to the West and just up at this East edge, there's a, a property here that was just recently rezoned to CD. Um, this whole section of 4500 South going up to Atwood Boulevard was uh, redesignated in the future land use map in 2017 for commercial um, development as, as a pretty good frontage with a lot of high traffic. We felt like uh, there was an opportunity to let properties as they, as they redeveloped go fully commercial instead of geo. Um, Mostly it's a question of different uses that are allowed. And in this particular case of sew and fit, that's exactly what it is. The, um, the gentleman that, that requested the zone change bought the property and wants to run a tailor shop there, an alteration shop. You don't get to do alterations in the general office zone. We don't know exactly why, but you're not allowed to do that. And the CD zone will allow um, tailor shops, alterations and that kind of thing. So he asked for the zone change. It's supported by the general plan. The planning commission held their meeting on November 19th. There were 39 notices sent out. Um, no public comments were received. Um, they did vote six to zero to recommend that approval uh, based on the, the findings that you see there. The general plan does support it and the zone change uh, makes, makes sense. Um, we'll probably eventually see all of those properties come in. Um, this will be the third since the plan changed or fourth. Uh, we are, so planning commission and staff both recommend approval. Um, if you have any questions. Dale, do you have any, anybody have questions? Sorry, I'm just looking. Anyone? I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, right. but, uh, Jared, he's gonna, are you gonna take that off, Jared? And then I'll build oh, a seat. Yeah, sorry. Now. No, I, no, that's okay. Yeah, to, no. no, hey, you're great. Is it gone? Thank you. Okay, yep. there you go. I'm not asking us to do this, but when you said um, you can't do tailoring in a, a GO, is that something that you say, because you said, I don't understand why they wouldn't do that. Is that something we could say, hey, let's let's put that in there? Yeah, I think I think it actually goes with the, the dry cleaning, which I'm, I'm also not entirely sure why dry cleaning isn't necessarily allowed in the GO zone. Um, but there's, there's some things that just aren't. Thanks, Jared. Is this something that we can add to the conditional use, or does it need to have a full zone amendment? There, there would be two ways they could have approached it. So, and the gentleman asked the same question. Well, can I? Can you? Can you add the kind of thing I would do to the general office zone? And without delving in, so instead of delving into the larger question of whether or not there could be instances where that's inappropriate or not wanted, and there could be those. Um, since the general plan already called for it to go to commercial, we opted to go that route. So they're not mutually exclusive, the two ideas. Should we look at the general office zone and, and decide whether some of these things don't make sense? They kind of come up organically as people ask the questions because we have a, a sort of a limited bandwidth um, in the division. But as they come up, they, we ask the question and we keep a running list of things we ought to look into and then cross those off as we can. And that's one that we ought to look at. The, the use lists in all of the different zones is is on our radar we'd like to to revamp the entire zoning ordinance that'll be that'll be a big project we'll give you a headache for a couple of years on that one but in the meantime this one probably we would have reviewed it as a text amendment but it was easier to answer the question by just changing the property zone since it was supported 
So that's what we recommended. Anyone else have any questions? No? Okay. All right, well, thank you, Jared, for that. Um, let me go ahead and let's move on to the to item number three, discussion item number three, general plan and zone map amendments on 5445 South 900 East Sports Mall. Very good, Jared or Melinda, there you go. Is everybody seeing the, the slide screen? Okay. So this is a, a very similar, as you, as you all mentioned, this is a very similar application for general plan amendment and zone map amendment at uh, the sports mall properties. Um, it is a little bit smaller, 9.93 acres. Um, a similar story as well, the, um, the owners approached us as planning staff uh, not very long ago. And this was also, like I mentioned, on our, on our radar as a property that we should be starting to prepare to uh, to answer these questions, are we, are, you know, do we support this? Is this the right kind of, of zone change? Because it's going to come up eventually. Uh, we thought it was further out, um, but they approached us not long ago about making this change. So the sports mall property, it's a single piece, uh, nine, just over nine acres on the east side of 900 East. Um, kind of a, a beloved Murray icon, kind of sad to, to see it um, looking at being changed, but uh, the owners are at a point where they, they felt like they needed to explore their options because the market is changing on them. So right now it is in the CD zone. It does, like the other property, back up to a large, very stable residential area um, and kind of buffers between 900 East and that area. Uh, again, it's a large, deep property. Uh, the zone, CD, is not supported as a, as a category by the commercial, general commercial future land use map designation. But again, we have that statement in the commercial general category. And as Rosalba pointed out earlier, this is that, you can see that um, node right there at 56 and 9th East. So we're, it's close to this area where we wanna be looking at the possibilities of things being different um, that Diane was discussing as well. So we'd love to have had a chance already to, to study this area and see what's appropriate. We haven't had that opportunity yet in the the uh, requested change came up. Uh, we do feel like at this at this level out, it's again forty units per acre um, in this in this area because it's further out from from the higher density transit corridors. So forty units per acre, it would require a commercial component because it's on Ninth East, just like the Kmart site. There's a really natural uh, ability to provide commercial on Ninth East with some supported uh, residential uses in the back that we can sort of buffer the single family neighborhood from a a mid to high density residential development here and then commercial on Ninth East. So staff uh, recommended for it. We do feel like it makes sense. The, uh, again, the same same screen, these are the differences, the 50 feet that we've talked about before, um, the, the setback requirements. Um, mixed use, this is one thing that I, I didn't really point out in the RC Willie discussion that I'll, I'll take the opportunity to do now. Um, I'm gonna go back to the aerial slide. Mixed use is like this. There's, there's two ways that we can do mixed use. And this, this particular slide affords me an opportunity to talk about it better. Um, vertical mixed use is where you put the commercial on the ground floor of a, of a taller multifamily building. So apartments above and commercial below. Um, while you could do that kind of development here on this property, it's much more likely with the traffic crossing wanted to do and do what's called a horizontal mixed-use development. In other words, there would be pad sites out here on Ninth East, restaurants or small shops or something like that, and then residential to the rear. Horizontal mixed-use developments in the zone that's proposed, MU, are required to provide a central feature that ties the two components together. Um, they're required to provide um, pedestrian walkways throughout that connect everybody within the development and then out to the street. They're required to consider potential developments that might come uh, around them and, and either buffer or provide connections or the potential for connections to them. So there's this, this other component that gets reviewed and it allows us then to look at some kind of central feature and often it looks like something like that. So I'm using this slide to say, if there were a central component, there'd be commercial out here and some sort of some sort of plaza or something that makes it a very livable place. So you have an opportunity with mixed use development to do more than 
what's been done in the past with box development, where the, the Best Buy is built and there's 452 parking spaces between it and the street, and you take your life in your hands to cross to get uh, your your laptop or whatever it is. And you drove there because you only went for the one thing. This is the opposite of that kind of development. That's the kind of development that was done for years and years and years. And as the as the new as the new decades unfold, you're going to see more and more pressure for mixed use development. They are nice places for people to live and they can be really good additions, even though they're further out in these kind of instances from the central business districts and from our central core on State Street and the rail lines. This area is is pretty vibrant already. There's a lot of activity in this area. Um, in, in my opinion, as a planner, it would be great if some of that activity fed into and was part of a mixed use development on a site like this. Um, just the, the the kind of development that it could be would be a good addition to the area and maybe would spark some of the changes that we'd like to see as, um, as we already talked about in the other project in the larger area as well around that node. Um, so with that said, the Planning Commission did hold a public hearing on the matter the same night. Um, I believe it was on the same night. December 3rd looks wrong to me. Maybe it was December. No, yeah, it was December 3rd. Sorry. I have December 17th on my mind now. But December 3rd, 134 public notices were mailed out. That's the same distance used, uh, 500 feet, because it's a larger property. Uh, we did receive one comment um, about the project stating their concerns about the noticing. Um, that they felt like the timing during Christmas was suspicious, et cetera, um, and concerns about property values being degraded by the kind of um, development that would come. The Planning Commission did vote seven to zero to recommend approval, and these findings are largely the same as those that were uh, used for the R.C. Willey site. Um, and we've already kind of covered all of those topics, and so I'll, I'll leave it to you for questions if you'd like. Anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? Uh, yes, pretty much the same. Right. <laughs> I mean, we can just, you can just kind of ditto what I, what I said sure. before. This is also a general plan amendment. And so I think we need to be very careful uh, and uh, research it thoroughly and make sure it's the right thing to do with that, with that area. Um, so anyway, that's... That's my concern. I think we can be more creative, and, and I hope we'll we'll uh, do that. And you. you know, anyone else, Brett? Yeah, I was just going to express my same opinion. So, um, I just want to say thank you, Jared, for talking a little bit more about the the structure and the layout and how that differs horizontal versus vertical. And one thing when I was reading through. Uh, the description of both is uh, the difference in landscaping and some of those community features you see in mixed use that you don't see in the other zone. Uh, again, I'm a, I'm a fan of mixed use. Um, I've heard from many residents, we need more housing. Um, I mean, I know we have a lot of data on that as well, but just anecdotally, a lot of um, people looking for those apartments um, and especially new apartments. And I know that there is a want for that. Um, my biggest comment for the... Um, just to speak to what Diane mentioned about the general plan is, and also to what you, you shared as uh, the questioning, the timing over Christmas. And it's hard, I know when we're in government and cities and we have our timelines and you know don't stop working the whole month of December just because that's when people are busy. Um, but I do think the advantage of, of the general plan is that it, it gets all that attention. So it is easier for the public to give feedback. Um, so, um, and the hard thing is we're gonna always have to do amendments. And I know that, and there's there's no like nefarious hidden zoning happening, um, but but it's hard for residents to keep up and it's hard for them to follow and to be, um, you know, just aware of all of this. I really, as much as possible, appreciate sticking to the general plan because that's when they can really focus in that energy and um, pay attention once every couple of years. But, but I, am, I am a fan of mixed use and I, I think that it creates nice walkable neighborhoods and I'd rather walk, you know, in, in that sort of environment than I would across those giant parking lots. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you so much, Jared. I think that is, yep, that's the last one. So thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. 
All right, we'll go ahead and move to item number four, which is um, CAT for Diver Diversity and Inclusion Ad Hoc Task Force. Go ahead, CAT. Yes, thank you. And I'm very excited to be talking about it again tonight. I'm going to share my screen, which fills me with anxiety. And do you need to give me special permission, Jan, or should I already have it? I should already have it. Okay, let's see if I can. Yeah, you should be able to share. Okay. Anyone want to give me a hint? Oh, I found it. It's the green thing. Thank you. I spent all day on Google Meet and Zoom is just enough different to cause me great anxiety. I'm just trying to make Brett feel better is what I'm doing. I'm just trying to. Thanks, Kat. Uh -huh. Anytime. Okay. Thank you all for your patience. You should be seeing an image of my three cute nephews. Do you see them? Okay. So before we get going um, on the changes that have happened and, and why this is back at Committee Hall is I wanted to introduce you to my nephews. Damien is the larger boy in the back in the Batman sweater. Um, and then his twin Atticus is in front. And then their little brother Everett's behind. And I felt really strongly about sharing them with you this evening because tonight is the fourth anniversary of Atticus's passing. Um, and so I always like to talk about him at this time, but he's a huge part of why I feel really passionately about inclusion um, and ADA accessibility and um, fighting just for, you know, anyone with a disability to have, you know, as much access as anyone else. And so on this anniversary, I just wanted to share this darling picture of him and to share all three of them are hitting the road. They were going on a walk around their neighborhood and they're all three on completely different types of um um, on exciting things, right? We have little Everett on the tricycle, Atticus had his walker, and his brother Damien had his big two-wheeler bike. Um, so they needed different types of equipment to have the same task. So I'm going to go on. And so I shared this last time we talked about it, but I just think it's really a good example of um, equality versus equity um, and why it's important to talk about the two. Um, and we'll get into that a little more deeply. Um, first off, I know you all read the packet um, multiple times and have it memorized, but I'm gonna go over a couple of the parts of the charter that I shared. So this is in the, um, the packet in the charter for the ad hoc task force. And that's the need to, um, for the creation of the ad hoc task force stems from the changing demographics of the city. As the city continues to grow and change, it's necessary to research and examine current city practices and policies related to diversity and inclusion across city governments and the impacts of these practices and policies on marginalized communities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the change of the ad hoc task force piece in just a minute, but I wanna go on to um, just touch um, base with the ad hoc task force shall assist the city to improve the quantity and quality of inclusive experiences and opportunities for residents, employees, and visitors. And I want to pause there and say, you know, one thing we all love about Murray and I think residents are all really proud of is our amazing services and the community we build. Um, so this effort is in no way to disparage um, what we're already doing that is fantastic, but to make sure that everyone can access all of the amazing things we're doing. And my husband just got home from work, so the dog is surely going to bark any moment. So apologies on the timing there. Um, then the task force shall assist the city to provide a strong sense of community, actively engage residents, support events and traditions that build bridges within the communities, and to ensure services are equally accessible, right? So that all of the amazing things we're already doing, um, that we're identifying barriers um, that can be removed um, and recommended changes to the city. And so just one more time, equality is treating everyone the same and equity is treating everyone fairly. And that's the, really the core of, of the work of this task force. Okay, so talking about the changes, why we're back at Committee of the Whole with this, is the ad hoc task force shall complete or cause to be completed a fact-finding activity. So you might remember talk of a survey, survey previously. There's office for all the fact-finding work, the acquiring of bids that they did um, in looking at surveys. Um, but what was discovered is marginalized and minority communities are really difficult to survey. And the core root of that is, there it is, sorry. Um, it's 
I mean, the same reasons there are barriers to access and involvement in the community. Um, so sort of the reason a survey is impossible is the reason this task force is really important. Um, but I am really grateful uh, to the mayor's office for all the, the legwork they did on that and, and the bids and the conversations we had as we sort of figured out the best shape for this task force. The other change you'll notice is that rather than being um, a committee, that it's an ad hoc task force. And the reason for that change um, is that there didn't seem to be a department within the city um, that was the right fit to house the task force. And the reason for that is that this task force and its members are gonna make recommendations to the council and the mayor that impact all aspects of the city. Um, so that's why it really makes sense to house it in the council's office. Um, there's a past precedence and history of ad hoc task forces being housed within the council um, in the past. So this direction is both appropriate and judicious and as it allows flexibility um, in the impermanent nature of an ad hoc task force. So that's um, a change from the last time I presented it to you. Um, I shared some of these last time, but I just wanted to review them. And um, we sometimes hear, you know, maybe that there isn't as much diversity in the city as, as there is. 10% uh, of Murray, Murrayites uh, identify as Hispanic or Latino, including my family. 12% uh, has a language other than English spoken at home. 5% identifies LGBTQ or plus. And one in four adults live with a disability, um, and there's a wide range of different kinds. Um, and I bring the, oh, and I forgot that one, 60,000 refugees live in Utah, and most of them are in Salt Lake County, with um, a good number living here in the west part of Murray. Um, so I, I share all of that just to say there is a need, there is a huge diverse um, part of our population that I think we can include more and make sure they have access to all the wonderful things we're already doing here in Murray. Um, which is really important to me. So the big question I've gotten is, so where do we find these people to sit on the committee? Where do they come from? Who are they? Um, if we can't survey them, how do we find them, right? Which is a really good question. So this task force will be made up of nine members. Five must be residents of Murray and four could be business owners or community partners that work in Murray or directly provide services to those in Murray. But um, obviously the ideal being that they either live or work in Murray. Um, so I've been working with different partners um, in the community already, uh, forming relationships and finding people who are interested. And this is just some of those organizations I've reached out to and had meetings with so far. First is In Circle and Pride. Um, I've had some conversations with them and they're very excited to connect um, someone in Murray with the committee to represent that population. IRC is the International Rescue Committee and they serve refugees uh, all over the state, but they do placement and all sorts of trainings. Um, and so they're very excited to help find um, um, one of their uh, refugees to serve and they have a few in mind already. <laughs> Uh, Utah has an OCA chapter, that's Asian Pacific Islander Advocacy Group, and our own representative, uh, Representative Kwanzaa member, and so they're excited to plug someone in. DRAC, which is, I always put the wrong acronym, this was Disability Rights Action Committee, I always get the word action wrong, um, and I have many friends in their uh, leadership, and they're very excited to have someone uh, meet with us. Um, Murray Baptist Church, we all know Pastor Merrill, um, and then we have Utah Black Lives Matter here in Murray as well to find a person of color to serve. Um, also St. Joseph the Worker, which is located in Taylorsville, but serves a large amount of our uh, Murray Catholics, and they have a really robust Spanish mass um, and are happy to work with us in connecting an interested Murray resident. And then there's the Murray School District Equity Council. They have been really gracious in letting me sit in on their meetings and the work they're doing at the district level. And uh, whether it's a, a teacher or family, um, but just in kind of reaching out to people already doing work here in the community who are interested. Um, we have Head Start here as well as Boys and Girls Club. And I'd love um, for a um, even a teen from the Boys and Girls Club who cares about their community a great deal and bringing in someone from um, you know, the youth to have an experience and, you know, shaping their community and sharing their experience. And on the other side, I don't actually have in this slide, but we have our fabulous Murray Senior Recreation Center um, to make sure that ageism on both sides is covered. 
And then finally, Utah Apartment Association and Utah Housing Coalition, um, connecting with those interested um, to represent renters or those maybe um, just with a different experience here in the community. So this is like 12 or 15, I didn't count after my last edit, different places where I'm already um, having formed relationships and with interested parties. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that we're not gonna have any trouble finding nine amazing candidates and excited that these being open meetings that if you know someone's interested, but their nine spots are taken, that they can still attend and participate on a community level. Um, so just to sort of like finish up, what I wanted to tell you about before I open for questions is just a review of diversity is who makes up our community, who we are. Inclusion is who has a voice. And that's why I feel this task force is really important to create a space for those voices that haven't been really heard or don't feel heard um, to create a space to get them more plugged into the community, to even the city government as a structure and how to navigate it with their communities, um, like as ambassadors. Equity is achieving equal access, treatment, opportunity, and advancement for all people. So that's the recommendations that they make and how we can better achieve that. Um, so the Diversity and Inclusion Ad Hoc Task Force will provide recommendations. And I really wanted to highlight that. Um, I know, especially in a rough budget year, that it, the idea of doing something new or extra seemed um, a little bit intimidating. Um, but their recommendations and some of them may be easily implemented as policies or procedures and some may be long-term goals that we want to you know place as an actual codified long-term goal but that we know we can't necessarily throw funds at immediately um, so finally this is to ensure all murray residents employees and businesses are included valued and heard and an excuse to show you one more picture of the adorable atticus who's the cutest kid in the whole world um, but I'd love to answer any questions you have. I'll take down the screen so we can see each other better. Um, but that's what the updates I wanted to give you on that stop share. There it is. Okay. Any questions? Brett? I'll just tell you a great presentation, Kat. You, that was awesome. Um, and uh, I appreciate you sharing some of those personal stories with us too. That's, that's cool. Well, one of my questions is, we, as a council then, the selection committee for this, will we all be on that as a council to be able to help select? So thank you for asking. I had a note to talk about it, but I didn't look at my notes because I was nervous. Um, so thank hey, you. For you did a great job, Kat. Thank you. Um, so how I envision it is, um, you know, reaching out and having an open period for all of the applications to come in and then having the council receive them very similar to the way um, in hiring um, for Jan's replacement. That sentence upsets me. Um, <laughs> but um, how we all had the applications and then we picked our top number. And so having everyone pick their top nine and then sorting from there and hopefully having one other member on the council willing to sit um, and sort through those uh, with me to, to make sure that we've got, you know, the, the top picks for everyone and making sure everyone feels like it's meeting the intent of the membership and the city and that representation. If I could suggest, I love that. I really would like to have us, as far as the, what we did with Jan's uh, position, um, it was just that, like you said, the two that made the decision. Well, there was more, but the two council. I'd like to see all of us on that, uh, uh, not just to say, oh, we like this, like that, but to be all five of us to be involved. And and it would have to be like an agreement, like a, just like we do on a vote, that we uh, make those decisions on the sele selection committee. Absolutely. And that would, that would definitely be my intent. I want to make sure awesome. that everyone feels like... Um, they're represented and that we're not missing any voices. Um, absolutely. And I'm, I'm very open to feedback logistically of how to achieve that um, in the best way. Jan, awesome. or, Thanks, Kat. Kat, before we move on, Gia, what is, is it, is there anything in code in terms of how that process works out? Because I know when we did Jan's position, we realized it was in code. In terms of how it works out, do you mean getting all of the board of the committee well the committee yeah so what 
are we, are we do we have to adhere to code in terms of yeah if you're all five going to make a decision you'd be together in a meeting to have those conversations mm -hmm. is that what you're as asking far as, well as far as the selection committee goes and 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 how that works yeah, so the selection committee um, is a little bit different mm -hmm. model because um, although they saw the application they didn't see all the applicants but if you're going to have all the applicants um, interviewed, for example, uh, by the council, it have to be in a public meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Jill. Go ahead, Dale. Sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. I was just going to say I volunteered to, to sit with Kat uh, to go through the, the uh, final applications. Thank you. Yeah, I would love any support help um, in doing that. And and the reason I suggested that the email was uh, an opportunity to read and even rank, you know, here's my top nine and sort it or something like that so that we um, can do as much without the um, public meeting before interviews or individually or that kind of thing. Um, Perfect. Diane, go ahead. Uh, Kath, I think it's a wonderful idea, and I'm so glad you took this on. It's, it's, it's great, and I think it reflects really well on our city and our council that we're willing to do it, and I think we all are. So I have a concern on your governance charter of the membership of the ad hoc task force number three that says the ad hoc task force shall automatically terminate and disband upon the final submission of its recommendations to the city. Uh, I would like it to be an ongoing task force. And what that says to me is that they will have, um, you know, recommendations and then it will be disbanded. So that's, that's my only concern is I would like it to be ongoing until of course, the, you know, if the council at some point decided to disband it, but, um, as we talked about, I don't want it to be one and done. I would, I would really like to, to have this uh, continue on and um, make many recommendations to the city. So just my comment. May I address that? Go ahead, Joe. So when we talked, when Kat and I talked about this, um, an ad hoc committee is specifically for a specific purpose, and that was to get this rolling to see what issues are out there and how can we address them? Um, you wouldn't have an ad hoc committee continue on. What you, what you would do is if you wanted something more permanent, you would then look at a, some type of ordinance that would establish a, a group. But mm. there's an ad hoc committee, you, you, I mean, they have a certain purpose. Once that, once that purpose is fulfilled, then you, you disband that. So the purpose can't just be ongoing. It needs to be a specific purpose. Um, yeah, you know, then, you're looking at a committee that is is essentially outside the order process. It's temporary in in nature. Uh -huh. We had we had uh, talked earlier about potentially having a committee or board or whatever you want to call it, but it ended up with an ad hoc committee. So the reason it's written that way is that's the nature of an ad hoc committee is it doesn't go on forever. It just it does what it needs to do and then it moves on. If, if one, one of the recommendations of that committee, for example, was to have more permanency, certainly you could consider it at that point, but uh, I, I just wouldn't have it written right in this as this is a perpetual ad hoc committee. Huh. You can get to the same place you want to, you can't use this vehicle. Gotcha. And so the goal is to, you know, we have the members, they, you know, discuss, we assess their needs and access to different things and, and policies and procedures in and outside the city, um, government and community, I mean. And then they will present recommendations to the council and the mayor in a, in a meeting. And I mean, that would be our opportunity to say, you know, these are really valuable. And this is something that we want to, as, as GL said, codify and make sure that we continually have this type of feedback or it's, these are really great recommendations and this is this is what we're going to work on for a bit and you know then then see from there but this is sort of our um 
introduction to this type of work as a city and uh, but it allows us to have a really strong first draft before moving forward in a more codified way. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Brett? Just, just thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kat. That was great. And um, I think disability is important to all of us as well. So I want to give Atticus a fair shout out as well in, in from your presentation. That was sweet. Um, and, you know, the, being being one member that would love to see this as, as far as the Hispanic community, along with Kat, I should say, it, it is important. And I think it, it will find that we needed it all along and we didn't know why. So I think I think it's a great start. So thank you so much, Kat, for taking this on and, and putting it together. I really do appreciate it. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and move on to our next item, item number five, or wait, Kat, do you have anything else to add before I do? Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, item number five, federal aid agreement with Utah Department of Transportation, and Danny will be presenting. Danny, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity, but I'm going to let uh, Trey give you a little bit of background and uh, uh, of, of how this, uh, this came about and, and what the federal aid agreement does. Thanks, Danny, and uh, thanks, uh, Council, for the opportunity to be here tonight to uh, discuss uh, the Federal Aid Agreement for Transportation Funding uh, to make improvements to the intersection at uh, 5300 South and College Drive. Uh, this has always been a, uh, a pretty busy intersection. Uh, if you ever uh, drive it in the morning or in the evening, it's uh, fairly congested. Uh, traffic engineers grade this intersection or grade intersections based on uh, a level of service. And um, right now, uh, this intersection currently operates at a, a level of service E during the PM peak times, um, which is kind of acceptable, but uh, not desirable. Um, with the expansion of the Security National Office development, uh, the intersection becomes heavily congested and uh, the future PM level uh, of service drops to an F, which uh, is, is what we really try to avoid. Uh, F indicates, uh, you know, mass failure and, and a lot of congestion and a lot of issues. So uh, the level of service F uh, raised concerns for uh, public works and for engineering. So um, both in 2017 and 2018, uh, we applied for federal grant through Wasatch Front Regional Council, uh, specifically aimed at reducing congestion at this intersection. Uh, in 2018, we were successful and awarded uh, about 1.7 million in federal uh, CMAC funds to make improvements to the intersection that uh, reduce congestion and um, hopefully uh, improve air quality. Uh, the improvements primarily focus on additional turn lanes in the westbound and southbound directions that uh, reduce delays for turning vehicles, uh, which improves the overall level service of the intersection. Um, as a secondary benefit, uh, the project will also improve safety uh, for pedestrians that routinely, routinely cross 5300 South uh, in the north-south direction. And this has been a, a concern for uh, quite a few years. Uh, so tonight in council meeting, uh, the Public Works Department will be asking uh, the council to consider a resolution approving this agreement with UDOT for federal aid highway funds for improvements aimed at reducing congestion at uh, the 5300 South and College intersection. Uh, if approved, uh, we will uh, begin design and right-of-way acquisition uh, probably within the next uh, month to six weeks and uh, plan to construct this project uh, next year. Um, it won't be before the, uh, the new Security National building opens, but it will generally uh, um, probably coincide with, with that building as it, as it gets occupied and we start to get uh, a, lot, a lot more traffic in that area. So 
Um, with that uh, brief introduction and information, do any of you have any questions or concerns with, uh, with this, this agreement? Anyone have any comments? Dale, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. I love the, the grade that you gave us for traffic. <laughs> and I'm wondering, uh, that, that would help us a lot if we, let's go back to R.C. Willie and I'm back was for traffic to do R.C. Willie <clears throat> like you just did. And maybe that's a federal thing, I don't know. But that would help us a lot in making decisions on developments and, and traffic as we go forward. Well, I can, I can tell you that, uh, you know, nearly any development um, in, of any size that comes into Murray, we, uh, we do require a traffic study and we do require analysis of the intersections and we do develop a, a level of service. And, you know, one, just as a side note, and, and again, this is sort of moving off topic, but, you know, for the RC Willie site, um, that site generates over the years, a lot, a lot of traffic. Um, RC Willie's has been a, 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 you know, a very successful business and, and, um, you know, Saturdays and, and afternoons that, uh, you know, existing building generated a lot of traffic. Now, um, I don't know if the new development will generate more or not, but uh, ultimately, uh, before we get to that point of approval, the developer will do a, a full traffic study. We will look at any changes of that level of service and we'll try to, um, you know, hold the development uh, to, uh, you know, mitigating some of those some of those issues. And, um, you know, again, I think Jared said the uh, the intersection uh, Winchester Ninth East. They're they're major arterials. Uh, they're intended for a lot of traffic, and ultimately, uh, I, I think they'll absorb a lot of what this, uh, you know, development uh, may end up generating. So um, traffic may not be quite quite as bad as what uh, we're thinking. Now, there are other locations in Murray where I, I, I'd bite my tongue and I won't say that. And, <laughs> but uh, in that location, um, traffic isn't as big of an issue as in other locations. And, and there's ways to mitigate some of that, that traffic too. Thank you. I'm just, what I'm saying is if when we get these presentations, if we either now or at a later date have a, a grade on traffic like you just did, that, that would help us out, uh, an immense amount, I believe. But thank you for that presentation. It was great. Sure, sure. I had the same thought, Dale. I thought if we knew what grades every intersection kind of was with development, it would help us. But it's not a part of it. I don't think it's a part of the process, right? In terms of the application, it, I'm, I'm it's still. It really comes after the zone change. You know, we don't really know exactly the makeup of the development. So it's tough to predict that traffic and right. that level of service. Now, um, something that we are working on right now is a, uh, a transportation plan update based on um, our general plan. And and it's sort of a moving target with all of these zone changes, and it's actually delayed um, some of the work we've done on the transportation plan. We've had to go back and and model on several occasions or remodel based on some of these zone changes that have come through. Um, it doesn't get down to that real granular level or that really you know small level. It looks at it more on a big picture, but we are looking at level of service of roadways. We don't go into every intersection, but we do put grades uh, on, on most of the major transportation systems, collectors, arterials, things like that. So that is um, in process. We're about 80%, 75-80% done, and um, we will be uh, presenting uh, the the, the plan and uh, to the public, to the council, to the planning commission, and getting a lot of feedback before we um, at ultimately ask for council approval on that. So over the next three or four months, you'll 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 be seeing a little more of me. Thank you, Trey. I actually was curious about some of that as well. So there you go. Any other questions, comments, concerns? We always 
love changes and that we get money. So thank you so much. Sure. Um, all right, thank you, Trey. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next phase of this, um, to item, discussion item number six. Um, so committee participation by council members, and I will be presenting. Um, we're gonna go kind of just jump into this. Um, there are, I'm sure in your packet you saw that there are some openings that are coming up for the next year. And um, let's go ahead and start off um, with the Association of Municipal Councils. To be on that, it's with the county. Jen, right? We're just gonna go ahead and, okay. Um, I don't mind doing it again, but if somebody else has a desire to kind of sit on that, it's on every Tuesday, every Tuesdays at noon, or sorry, second Tuesday at noon. Is all yeah. Yeah. I know that in the past, and this was up to the council, council, but in the past, since it's fairly new and we've only done most of these once each, mm -hmm. that you, we can motion crazy. that if, if you would, if everyone still like to do what they're doing, I, I, I'll motion. And if we don't want to do it, don't do it. But I'll motion that uh, we just keep everything the same as last year. I would My second point. that motion. Great minds. <laughs> <laughs> the oh, only really. thing is is that ulct requires a lot of attention and i Are you i feel that? like as, yeah i feel like as I, I don't you know and i don't know if i'll be chair or not but i feel like it should ulct and chair position should not be together that's the only thing um or or maybe it does i don't know i mean that's open for a discussion to have that's, um that's your call but yeah <laughs> you're calling I, that go ahead that, that's the only thing is I, I don't mind keeping it the same for for all of them, but that was my, I would love to give full complete attention to ULCT, but you know, with that position and with all the new changes, it's, I wanna be fair to, to giving ULCT the time that it does, it needs this, this session as well. Rosalba, if you want to stick with that to have it for another year, and I now know with my work schedule that I have a lot more flexibility and can be a second a little bit easier. Um, for ULCT. <laughs> like if you want to, if you want to keep it, but I know that now we you know we were starting at the beginning, beginning of the year and trying to assess, you know, what schedules looked like when they were actually moving. Um, but that is something that I I can make and help with if needed. But if you want to stick with it, I'm just uh, I'll be on deck as backup. I think it definitely could use two council members. <laughs> it is such a it is such a great opportunity. Go ahead, yes, Jen. I just wanted to say that we have one voting member from the council. And so we really need to just have one person that can concentrate on that and be consistent. I think it's great if others want to attend and learn what's going on, but we do have one voting member from the council. But but could Cap be someone who, if Rosalba was not able to do it, could be a backup to that? An alternate vote? No. no. Has to be whoever. I'm okay, okay with Cap taking it, and I yes. can be filling. <laughs> I would be happy to take it if if you if you need a break from it. I would be I would be very interested in, in taking it on. I think it's such a great opportunity, and and you probably are more familiar too. Well. I think we all are because of your um, experience with women's, you know, the women's council. So I think it would be an awesome opportunity for you. Well, then I would be happy to take it on. Thank so, you. So can I back my motion and say, uh, I'll move that we approve all and with the exception of uh, ULCT, and that's not called that. What is it, uh, Rosalba? Yeah, ULCT legislative Co policy. Okay. Committee. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. Sorry. Yeah. The COW, we don't make motions in. Yeah. Except for me. The whole. Do that, so, you have to so what do how do we? Give me the whole to vote on it. So if you're. So Sorry, if you're, can you say that? I think, yeah, I think GL's right that usually it's just been by mutual consent rather than a motion, if that works for you, GL. Well, no, no, I don't think there can be any decision made in this meeting. 
But if you bring it, we always said it in this meeting. We we've always done it here. Yeah, we're always we're wrong. Wrong. then we've always been wrong <laughs> because we've always done it in the committee of the whole. We don't take action in this city other than the minutes, right? So what you're doing is if you're okay to, to go that direction, come back to the next meeting, make a motion, make a voice, vote however you want to do it. In the in the council meeting? Yes. Okay, now I've had I thought we've had things in here that we have okay, you're hey jail. I'm not gonna argue because you're the attorney, so <laughs> I'm gonna go with you. But we no. have you're right, we've done it wrong then because we have we have most we have yeah. We've so never done a formal motion. It's just always been kind of by agreement. So, yes, but what, but, what you're doing here, you know, if, you're, you're if having, you want them to vote on it in the council meeting, yes. we would have to agenda that on January 19th then, because it's correct. not on the agenda for tonight. Think about what you're doing, though. You're putting a council. So, yeah, it should be a formal vote of some yeah. sort. Okay. We'll do it next week if Rosalba says that's a word. <laughs> Yeah, let's do it next, you know, not next week, but the next council meeting. We're going to do it when, when no one is around. <laughs> no, no, thank you so much, Jail, for that. Um, I will I will still be a part of ULCT, but we'll go ahead and move forward to voting on this for the next. Yeah, that's so interesting that we've never done it that way. Oh, my goodness, Jail, thanks for letting us know. <laughs> We like change, right? Yeah. Who was on the ULCT board last time, Dale? Yeah, Dale. So you're still it, Dale? I'm just kidding. Yeah, and before <laughs> then, I was. So. No, you were on the ULCT board last time. <laughs> nice try, Rosalba. All right. Well, thank you so much. Okay, well, I guess we kind of, so I will stay on with the Association of Municipal Council. So this is just discussion. And then... Um, Everybody will keep their same positions and Kat will take on ULCT for, and then we'll bring that back to a vote on the 19th, right? The 19th, yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for that and that clarification, GL, and we'll go ahead and move on um, to item number seven, appointment of interlocal board representatives and Mayor Camp will be presenting. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the first meeting of January is when we uh, always uh, approve the uh, appointments for the representative of the boards of the interlocal entities. Uh, we uh, have not, um, we are not planning to recommend any changes this year, uh, just keeping everyone the same with one exception. And that is that, uh, the, that Jennifer Kennedy has been the CAP representative uh, for the Utah Community Action Partnership and in speaking with Jennifer about this uh, um, a couple of week, a week or two ago, uh, it, it was decided that uh, because Murray has held this position, she's had this position on that board for about nine years, uh, that she felt like it would be uh, a good time to give another entity an, an opportunity to, for representation on the board. So therefore, we have uh, let uh, CAP know that uh, they will need to replace Jennifer's position with, uh, with with someone else, and then but that will not be someone from Murray. So, other than that, uh, everything else is the same. And I don't see a need to go through and read all these. You you all have the, them, and uh, and I and I know that you uh, know what words you represent. So, unless there's any comment or questions, uh, that will be coming uh, for in the next meeting for a vote. All right, thank you, Mayor. Anybody have any comments, questions? No? All right, thank you so much, Mayor, for your time and for that update. Okay, Jan, do you have any, do we have any announcements, Jan? Um, yes, I just wanted to mention to you, we've had an email on it, so you may be aware, um, the Murray City School Coordinating Council meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, January 13th. It's a one hour meeting that starts at 5 p.m. And um, we'll set up the Zoom meeting through the council office. That's all. All right, thank you, Jan, so much. 
Um, and with that said, Jan, thank you so much for coordinating this officially as your last solo and doing it all for us thus far. And I appreciate you. I just wanted to let you know that. Um, anybody else have anything to close out with tonight? All right. Okay. We will be back on, get a little break at um, 630 for the Municipal Building Authority meeting and then City Council meeting. Thank you so much, everyone.